Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. In the fabrication of inlays, crowns, and fixed bridge work using the indirect technique, inaccuracies in the dye on which the wax pattern is formed may often detract excessively from the clinical fit of the fixed restoration. Although currently no material is completely satisfactory from the standpoint of dimensional accuracy, detail reproduction, abrasion resistance, cost, convenience, and several other qualities, I believe that a recently introduced centrifuge epoxy resin material have the properties and characteristics that will make it the optimal dye material to use in dentistry. Most of you, I'm, I'm sure, are familiar with stone and silver plated dyes. Epoxy dyes, however, may not be as familiar to you and so I would very briefly like to explain to you how an epoxy dye is made. The rubber base is taken and a silver plated liquid is painted into the preparation and simply blown dry. This procedure is simply done to better demarcate the margin after the dye is trimmed. As you can see in this photograph, at the blue-silver interface, you can clearly see where that margin is. The rubber base is then boxed and set in the lower half of the pin setter, as you can see here. The upper half of the pin setter is then placed in a key position over the lower half, and dowel pins and retention screws are tightened in the appropriate areas. The upper half is then removed from the lower half while the epoxy resin material is mixed, poured into the preparation, and centrifuged for approximately one minute after which time the upper half of the pin setter is then set back in its key position over the lower half and the epoxy is allowed to harden for approximately 90 minutes. After this time, a stone base can be added, the dies are trimmed, the case is articulated, sent to the lab, and here you can see the return product. This whole process takes approximately 10 minutes, excluding drying time, of course. Looking at a comparison of the three different dye materials, stone, silver plated, and epoxy, I find that when we look at detailed reproduction or how fine a, a indent, surface indentation the material can reproduce, I found that epoxy gave us the best reproduction. Silver plated was next, and stone was also very good. And the difference basically here is due to the particle size. Looking at the electron microscope, we can see that epoxy, with the finest grain size of the three, reproduces a smaller amount of detail. However, basically, all three materials, I feel, can equally reproduce a good enough surface detail for the different properties that we are using in the indirect technique of fabricating gold restorations. A compatibility study shows that all three materials are compatible with polyether, polysulfide, and silicone rubber. However, if one wishes to use an agar hydrocolloid material, a stone dye must be used. When we look at the cost of the, ma of the material, which of course is very important in today's ever-rising price of materials, I found that epoxy and stone dyes had comparable laboratory fees, with the silver-plated dye being slightly more expensive on the whole. Looking at the setting time, the study shows that stone dye has the shortest setting time, at approximately 45 minutes. Epoxy dyes are next at 90 minutes, and the silver plated dye taking considerably longer, taking between 12 and 15 hours to acquire a suitable thickness of silver plating. When we look at abrasion resistance, I find that silver plated dyes are the most resistant to abrasion, epoxy dyes following being six times higher or more resistant to abrasion than a stone dye, which was the least resistant to abrasion. This is a very important characteristic when we consider all the waxing and finishing that we do on the dyes. The ease of waxing and handling, when this is looked at, I found that epoxy was the best of the three. As I've mentioned, it was more resistant to abrasion than a stone dye, and on the other hand, wax is more easy to adapt and keep adapted than a, a silver plated dye. In addition, due to the blue silver interface produced by the epoxy's unique technique, the lab technician can more clearly see where the margin is. And in addition, due to the two dowel pin technique which is used, the die is more, is more stable in the model and this allows for less adjustments of contacts and facilitates the seating of long span bridges. 
Looking at the potential of developing a dye which is unusable, I found that stone dyes occasionally can develop voids due to improper pouring. And silver, silver plated dyes, due to improper burnishing, can occasionally develop a flaking and of cusp tips and margins, and usually in the most inappropriate areas, as you can see here. Epoxy dyes, due to its centrifuging technique, consistently, to my knowledge, produce undistorted, void-free dyes. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, the dimensional accuracy of the three different dye materials. In the past, epoxy resin dye materials have not given the dimensional accuracy demanding of the dental profession. Because of this, I conducted a six-month study to determine the dimensional accuracy of the three different dye materials, stone, silver-plated, and epoxy dyes. Using two prefabricated bridge abutments with no bevel and a very small amount of taper, I took nine impressions of this master dye and poured them up in the three different dye materials, as you can see here. I then fabricated gold restorations, MOD, and full crowns to fit on each of the individual dyes to a point where I consider their fit excellent. None of, the, none of these restorations were finished or ground on whatsoever. They were cut directly from the sprue button. I then coated them and had nine DDS clinicians evaluate their fit back on the master dye, not knowing which material they came from, and using a criteria where one represented an unacceptable restoration and four representing an excellent one. I then soldered the MOD and the full crown together and had the bridge again evaluated as I have just described. The results basically show that for the gold crown, inlay, and bridge that all three dye materials give consistent and comparable dimensional accuracy and that on the whole none of the nine DDS clinicians could distinguish one material from another using dimensional accuracy as a criteria. In conclusion, in the past, stone and silver plated dyes have been the main materials that have been used in the indirect technique of fabricating gold restorations. You as a practitioner, I feel, are obligated to choose that material which yields the finest results in your hands in order to provide an optimal service not only for the dental profession but for the general public as well. Because of this responsibility, I feel that the epoxy resin material that I have shown you here today deserves to be considered due to its excellent characteristics. Epoxy dyes have good detail reproduction, are compatible with most commonly used impression materials. They are easily produced at a comparatively low cost and have a short setting time. They have a relatively high resistance to abrasion and demonstrate excellent manipulation and handling characteristics. They consistently produce undistorted, void-free dyes due to the centrifuging process and have a dimensional accuracy and fit that is comparable to the other commonly used dye materials and will give the dental practitioner a consistently excellent restoration. All these properties, I feel, indicate that epoxy dyes truly will be the dye material of the future. I would be happy to answer any questions on any of the material I have here on the table that produces the epoxy dyes or any of the restorations that are here. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Mark Luria, and I have been asked by the Student Table Clinic Committee to very briefly explain to you what a table clinic is and how one goes about starting preparation of a table clinic. A table clinic is very briefly a tabletop demonstration concerned with some phase of research, diagnosis, or treatment as related to the dental profession. They usually take approximately 10 minutes, and they're usually given several times during the table clinic program. Now at this point, you may be asking yourself several questions. First of all, how does someone go about starting to prepare a table clinic? And what if you have no idea on a topic to pick? Well, let me tell you, there are countless and hundreds of topics that you can pick on a table clinic. Previous winning titles have ranged from bacterial composition of saliva to the temporal mandibular joint examination to something as simple as an easier way of finishing composite restorations. So as you can see, there are just hundreds and, different, and many variety of topics that one can pick. However, if you do st still or you aren't quite sure of a topic, 
there are advisors, both in your class and faculty advisors, that would be more than happy to help you pick a topic. The second question you may be saying is, but I don't have any fancy things to show or any fancy ideas or you aren't real creative or artistic enough to present a good table clinic. Well, the table clinic that I'm showing you here today, I had help with from educational resources when I took it down to the National Table Clinic in Miami Beach. However, the table clinic when I first started, I simply took a poster that I labeled in my kitchen table and I took some slides and I took some study models. And with these three and a little motivation, I was fortunate enough to win first prize at the Student Table Clinic in 1977. From there, I took it down with help from an artists and educational resources I went to Miami Beach, and there I was also very fortunate to take first place honors in the National Table Clinic the competition there. And so you can see, a small idea sure goes a long way. And finally, you may be asking yourself another question. What's in it for me? Why should I even bother doing a table clinic when it's not even required? Well, to this, I can give you five reasons that I feel you should do a table clinic. The first reason is there are cash awards given for, uh, for the best table clinics. The year I gave my table clinic, there were only 10 dental students, and each individual dental student received a cash award. The second reason I can think for doing a table clinic is there is elective credit given for doing a table clinic. And if your table clinic is more involved than the, the usual table clinics, you may receive additional credit. The third reason I can see for doing one is you meet a lot of super people, not only at the dental school's table clinic presentation, but the dental societies such as the Washtenaw District Dental Society and the Michigan Dental Society ask you to give their table clinics at their dinner meetings. And I can assure you these are always a lot of fun. A fourth reason I can think is that if you win first prize at the school's competition, you receive an all paid exp expenses paid trip to to the city where the table clinic is held. And these are usually a drab place, such as, let's say, Las Vegas, or Miami Beach, or San Francisco, New Orleans, some place like that. And I can speak from experience that these are a lot of fun and make doing the table clinic worth it all. And the fifth reason I can think for doing it, if for no other, it's quite a learning experience. You really broaden your horizons from doing one of these, and you really get a, a wide range of what dentistry is all about. And so you can see, there are a lot of reasons for doing a table clinic. If you're interested in doing a table clinic, there is a student in your class that has all the information about it. And there's also a faculty advisor assigned. Please feel free to ask them any questions about the table clinics. Thank you very much for your attention. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.